everybody. My name is Rebecca Griffith. I'm the EDDPT, and I'm going to let my co-host introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Helena Esmond. I'm a neurologic clinical specialist, and I have been doing vestibular care for many years, and I am co-founder of Vestibular First, and I have worked in acute care and the ED and outpatient and inpatient rehab and home health. <laughs> so, you know, kind of covered the gamut there. Well, I'm so excited to have you with us tonight because while I do see a lot of patients with vestibular issues in the emergency department, I would not ever call myself a vestibular specialist. I like to think of myself as a jack of all trades. So I'm glad you're here to help us kind of take the most pertinent information from this massive uh, newly yeah. released guideline. <laughs> and what I think is great about this guideline is it's going to help us figure out what best, best practice ought to be for us and what best practice is being shared to our emergency physicians. But before we get started, if you're able to put your camera on, we'd love to see your beautiful face. And if not, that's all right. I understand that some people are like getting kids ready for bed, trying to cook dinner, doing lots of things at the same time. But if you're willing to indulge me a little bit, if you're working in the emergency department now, can you just raise your hand either with the reaction button or with your actual hand? Awesome. Beautiful. And if you're just interested in the topic, that's also great because I think this topic applies to many different settings. So we'll just dive in. And please, this should be interactive. So if you have questions, comments, or you want to say something, please feel free to do that. I'll keep my eye on the chat as well if you don't want to say anything in front of everyone. Um, but I think the first thing I'd like to do is just sort of summarize the purpose behind this article. And the purpose behind this article was to take a look at a presentation that is very common in the emergency department, and rightly so. Patients who are experiencing feelings of dizziness or vertigo can actually be completely incapacitated by those feelings, and they're just super scary. So if you wake up and the room is spinning, it's scary. It's definitely something that feels like it's not right and you need to get it checked quickly. So patients do come to the emergency department frequently, even if it's just for something more like lightheadedness or feelings of instability, it's very common. So it, it's definitely something that emergency physicians see frequently. Unfortunately, the differential diagnosis of dizziness is very difficult, partly because there are over 86 reasons why a patient could have dizziness. And usually in the emergency department, we're not actually gonna figure it out unless it's a very discreet and it's something solvable. But ideally, we're going to make sure it's nothing dangerous. So I think that's kind of where we come in. That's where this article comes in. How do emergency providers, whether that's a physical therapist or a physician, start that differential diagnosis process quickly to make sure the patient isn't actually having a life-threatening emergency? And then after that, what do we do next? Is it something we can actually intervene with today? If not, where do we need to send the patient next? Because I had a patient yesterday who, who's been having vague feelings of dizziness with occasional vertigo for years, has now seen a ENT, an audiologist, a neurologist, an, um, a cardiologist, her primary care physician, and is not getting any answers. So at that point, a frustrated patient appears to the emergency department, at which time the providers are like, you've had these symptoms for two years. What do you think we're going to do about it? Well, you're going to see the physical therapist because maybe they'll have an idea. So I think we need to know how to take a look at these patients, how to know what to do. And I think the other thing that you'll find in the summary of this article is that there are so many opportunities for us to get involved, intervene, and to provide training to some of our other medical colleagues. So with that, I'm going to ask you some questions, Dr. Esmond. All right, lay it on me. So I think the first question is, can you summarize for people how they are stratifying their dizziness diagnoses, this episodic situation? Like some people, when I talk to them about this, they, they've never learned that. So can we begin there? Sure. So um, I think this article, you know, does do a beautiful job of laying out um, many possibilities. Uh, they definitely focus on what we'll call vestibular presentations, but they emphasize two things. One is 
although you would hope it's implied, they stated out like um, that a medical team is supposed to do their due diligence on the basics. You know, is this person's hemoglobin super low? Is this person's oxygen level super low? Like, you know, it's other things that might be only one of many reasons they're dizzy, but it might be the primary reason they're dizzy. So, um, you know, that is not to be ignored in the ED. We can't assume that all dizziness is vestibular. Um, so once you're hopefully, you know, addressing those things or kind of a, a screening those, um, your next piece is they describe this article as really honing in on all the evidence they could find for acute dizziness of less than two weeks duration. That's really what they're trying to hone in on. Um, because as you say, um, kind of vague generalized fluctuant dizziness, um, which patients might also have a history of prior to this acute episode noted, right? So, um, you know, it could be a few uh, considerations there, but they're really trying to help out with these acute dizzy patients. And like you say, they're trying to sort out, is it dangerous? <laughs> like, are we having a stroke? That's the biggest, right? That's what they really want to make sure they don't miss. Um, and this article does, uh, in a few different points, points uh, rec uh, comments about how imaging, although it can be a very helpful tool, can miss uh, these strokes. And whether that's because the CT is not uh, as sensitive as we would like, particularly for small or early lesions, uh, but even for MRI, um, that kind of within that 24 to 48 hour window, um, we have a chance of missing these lesions. Um, so that's kind of probably one of the biggest things they're looking for here is how else besides imaging, <laughs> um, and, you know, in addition to trying to, you know, not image everyone all the time, <laughs> um, which they comment on a few times as well. But even if we want to just focus on saving lives and you know, say screw saving money, which I know people actually do want to save money, but let's just, you know, if we just want to focus on that, it's still better to have a good physical exam uh, than simply to image alone. I think that message is pretty clear. Um, and they kind of like, they trickle down from there as far as once you're kind of ruling out stroke and kind of related acute conditions that would need immediate management, whether that be, um, you know, thrombolytics or what have you, uh, to address a clot or whatever. Um, and they try to stratify, is it an acute uh, spontaneous, are we talking about spontaneous episode here? Is it triggerable, right? So they have a nice table one. If y'all wanna look at that in the article, I thought it was a good summary of this section. So we have acute vestibular syndrome, which could be a neuritis. That's something that's not fun for the patient, but not considered life-threatening. <laughs> So the inner ear is inflamed, it's got an infection in there, it's got maybe the cause of the neuritis is a little tiny, tiny clot just to the inner ear, uh, which we wouldn't necessarily call a stroke in the sense of a brain issue, but it's still a blood flow issue, just not to the inner ear. Whatever that's causing that neuritis, that's just at the inner ear level. That's why they call that benign, non-life-threatening. And then the kind of mimicker of that or what you're trying to really rule out is the posterior circulation ischemic stroke. Right. And then they talk about some more rare uh, familiar mimickers as well. So a bleed in that cerebellum um, or in the brain stem, which would be the posterior fossa area, um, Wernicke syndrome, labyrinthitis, multiple sclerosis. So these are kind of other things. Um, but usually the huge percent of folks are going to be dealing with A or B neuritis or posterior circulation stroke. And so what, um, what, was, what was the actual prevalence of posterior circulation stroke based on this guideline? It was low. Yeah, it was very low. I want to say between one, one and, between 1 and 7% or, or something like that, I want to say. Yeah, I so mean, most I, of the time, it's, it's still not going to be that, right? So I that's think right. It, we don't want to discount that, but I think it's also sometimes we have so much fear that we're going to miss that when actually the prevalence is extremely low. So right. I think now is a good time to just interrupt you completely and ask Go, you, please. Yeah. how do we make sure we're not missing those? Because we don't want to miss them. Right, right. So they do a nice job of saying how training is essential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
you know, so whether that's a physical therapist in the ED or a physical therapist, honestly, an outpatient who might suddenly have someone that presents into their office, you know, I have had this happen. They were someone I was seeing for BPPV. And then they came in, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling really bad today. And they start feeling worse and worse. And they were presenting with all the signs of what I knew to be an acute neuritis. And I was like, oh shoot, this isn't good, right? So they're like throwing up there, you know, it was, I still had to send them to the ED in the end just because they needed to like get medicated to calm down the amesis and stuff. But like, do you know what I'm saying? Like I was already reassured, like even though I knew they were going to hopefully due to their due diligence at the ER, I'm like, look, you're, I don't see signs of a stroke, but you still need to go. And, you know, um, you know, just to let you know, this is what I'm seeing. So, you know, it's not, I know we always think of this as like this whole article is about the ED, but the reality is the ED is just a place that people land, but they could be like this before they go there. Anywhere. Right? Anywhere. That's right. That's I right. Also, I, I'm also on a mission to keep patients out of the emergency department, right? So like, for me, if, if this patient presents to you an outpatient, if this patient presents to you in the home health setting, if you are working with older adults in a subacute rehab facility or assisted living facility, these are all patients who could have any of these things happen. So I think it's also helpful to understand what, what are the guidelines that the physicians in the emergency department should be following so that you're not sending patients to the ED for no reason. Like if they're not right. going to get any imaging, they're not going to get any medication, they're going to be sent back home. Please don't do that to your patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah. So with that training, what they want you to learn, one of the big pieces of testing, which you and I've talked about on and off in the past, because it's such a, a big, uh, helpful differentiator on a consistent basis is the HINTS exam. So the HINTS exam, they describe it in this article, but essentially it's a couple different physical tests. The first one is the head impulse test where you're giving the patient a quick little movement left and right, looking for what they call a corrective saccade. And I wanna point out that um, they point out some really lovely resources, some of which actually I didn't know were, were, I knew of the individual resources, but not of that accumulated page. I'm looking for where I highlighted it. Um, with, with video examples of what does a positive head impulse test look like. Um, a lot of the stuff that they put up was by Dr. Peter Johns, who's a, a longstanding proponent of good vestibular exam in the ED. He's a physician. Um, so at any rate, so head impulse test number one, um, ah, here it is, the ACEP website was one of them, acep.org backslash dizzy. Um, and it has like a nice comprehensive list of resources for anybody who would be dealing with the acutely disease patient, lots of video resources um, for things like how to do a HINTS exam. So definitely uh, I would recommend anybody who um, is even very, very familiar. It's not a bad review in my opinion. I always, I still will look at those things and be like, yep, yeah, okay, yep, yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I love refreshers. So um, head and pulse test number one. So that's the first part. N is just for nystagmus. And what you're looking for is spontaneous nystagmus. Um, and they describe in the article what a spontaneous nystagmus could look like in someone who has a brain issue. So you know, stroke is the one they're really looking for here the most, uh, which is direction changing nystagmus with gaze. So if they gaze right, it beats right. They gaze left, it beats left. They gaze up, it beats up, that kind of thing. Versus a spontaneous nystagmus that's beating consistently to say the left, which would be usually indicative of some sort of unilateral situation of vestibular neuritis. Um, and so that's what the N is, is looking at for looking for spontaneous nystagmus. So head and pulse, and then the N is nystagmus. T, S is test of skew. So this is where we do a cover on cover, and we're looking to see if there's an eye alignment uh, issue that would be indicative of a brain issue. Um, so that's a big, uh, I would say piece of what they'd like to see these emergency physicians learn how to do. But the article says at several points that there's a lot of barriers, uh, which doesn't mean they don't want to overcome them, <laughs> but they acknowledge there's turnover of staff, there's you know time issues, there's who's going to do the training and how much it's going to cost and how often do you need to refresh? Because uh, like I said, I'm very familiar. I've been doing vestibular care for 15 years and I still like to refresh. And I see with dizzy patients all the time. The, the physicians in the ED are seeing dizzy patients and patients with 
you know, cardiovascular issues and patients with, I mean, you, you know, it's the whole gamut in the ED, like every body system, right? Like, so, um, you know, it's hard to be a master uh, at the vestibular exam uh, when you're kind of having to be a master at a, a lot of other things, I would argue. Um, so this is where the challenge comes to, you know, how do we get whether it's a mix of physicians and physical therapists, whether it's you know primarily physical therapists, primarily physicians, I think it's going to depend on so many things in an individual location. Um, I think PTs can have a great role here, but I mean, I think I'm very aware of that different regions or different you know towns might have different resources and different you know um, opportunities for you know what that could look like. What do you think about that? So I, I think my question is, um, how do you make sure that people are trained properly and complain the HINTS exam? Because I, I have physicians say to me all the time, when I did the HINTS exam, it's normal. So I, I don't even think that's the right way to say that, right? Like, what is a normal HINTS exam? And then I also hear the HINTS exam is unremarkable. Or, I don't know, their HINTS looks fine, but like, there's yeah. never like any detail. So I, I get the impression that they don't actually know what they're looking for. Or I'll right. go in and repeat the test and then I'll call a stroke alert because they're not having what I would expect to see. They are having a positive test of SKU. Um, and they're like, well, I guess I didn't really know what I was looking for, but that could be a big time waster. Correct. Correct. Yes. So, you know, this article and myself, neither of us pretend to know the exact right answer, but what I would say is there are standards of care for other things. Something that I know that was happening at Einstein Hospital, where I used to work in acute care for many years for something as I guess not maybe that simple, but I, in my head, I'm like, oh, it's either on the CT scan or it's not pneumonia. So they had this, this kind of protocol for pneumonia screening and how they did it and what they monitored and it had to be done ABC and then they rechecked in so much time frame, And so they had like a standardized way of assessing it. And I think to standardize HINTS training is to have a standardized approach, say, all right, we're going to, you know, it's going to be part of our and that's where maybe it has to be accommodated, at least in individual like situations. So a lot of times in July, you have new residents coming in. So maybe like every August during our grand rounds, it's hence grand rounds. So it's early in their training and they have a blocked time and they have someone assigned to do that training. And if that's a physical therapist, I think that's brilliant. If for some reason that doesn't make sense for an individual hospital and they you know want to be someone else, as long as that person isn't like a, a solid expert on it, right? Someone who is maybe, you know, at least done vestibular care for years, has been working in the ED a long time, has done a lot of HINTS exams, and then using resources like, uh, I think Dr. John's, you know, standard how to do a HINTS is pretty good. Um, and, and so you show them and then you have that video and everybody watches that video. And that way, if there's a discrepancy between <laughs> what the person showed versus what Dr. John's did, hopefully that'll you know, give that opportunity. We know the training is about physically doing it. So you're going to need people to all physically practice. <laughs> um, but the hard part to me is actually watching the eye movements um, and having a standardized set of videos um, would be ideal. I think the other thing is uh, it's just like gait analysis, right? Like you have to see a lot of normal before it's easy to recognize abnormal. And most of the folks that we're going to see hopefully are having normal or like non-scary hints exams. So I think also it just takes a lot of reps. Yeah. hundred percent. No. And I love what you put in here about, um, you know, how to document, you know, uh, I see a question here. Ooh, do you have PT switch patients? if the PT who receives the consult for a vestibular patient isn't trained? I mean, yeah, uh, yes. If, if possible, I would argue that a physical therapist who isn't vestibular trained should probably not be in the emergency department, but there's always a moment when that does happen. Um, I've, I've had PTs who are covering on the weekend or on a holiday be like, oh, I don't do that. The problem with that is that is very confusing to the medical team. They're like, what do you mean mm -hmm. you don't do that? Like, 
we need you to do that. That's part of what you do here. So if, if somebody is not comfortable seeing a patient with a vestibular issue, and when I say comfortable, I mean, they are prepared to recognize something very scary and get that person emergency care, then they probably should not be seeing those patients. It's, um, it, it can be a huge liability if that's the case, if people are missing things, if they're not well-trained. Yeah, no, I totally understand. We've had that situation before as well. And um, there are definitely times where we don't necessarily have somebody who's vestibular trained or doesn't have enough experience. I think in those cases, with any, well, with any case, if you're not comfortable seeing a patient, then you just need to not see the patient or, or I've had to hold patients overnight for a therapist who could see the patient in the morning if they're really not safe to discharge. In that case, I really hope that the rest of your medical team is like adequately able to assess those patients. I said to one of our physicians the other day, hey, did you review these GRACE guidelines? I'd love to have a conversation with you about them. And the response was, well, I didn't read that, I've got you. Well, you know, I'm not always there. And also time is brain, right? So we need to make sure that everybody can screen very quickly and um, cohesively. Right. No, and I think this is where it's about trying to move the practice forward because, you know, we can imagine 50 years ago, I'm going to go back to the pneumonia case. They probably didn't have a protocol. They probably the way that it was happening, and I'm not saying this involved PTs, but, you know, just whoever was screening, you know, uh, physicians, you know, were spotty and maybe they sent somebody home that I'm having come back because they're, <laughs> they did, they did have pneumonia and they didn't identify it properly. So, you know, we know these things happen. So our best goal in my head is to move the practice forward in three ways. One is to empower more of the team on any given issue. So with vestibular, it's about empowering as many people in the ED um, of various disciplines, physicians and physical therapists for sure at a minimum, hopefully some PAs, things like that, you know, and, you know, say, you know, maybe this is a standard that we need to require for anyone who's filling in, you know, and that we have some, again, some kind of standardized training that is uh, at least an on-demand viewing that they can get to at least start. And then they say, okay, I'm going to go find you know, somebody that knows how this training and will practice head impulse test, you know, a time or two and kind of try to do some sort of standardization of competency uh, at a level so that you can have someone as good at always reading a CT and saying, yep, there's pneumonia as there's at least one person to say, yep, I can do this HINTS exam. Yeah. And, and we've had a similar issue where I like our providers expect us to be able to provide dry needling because some of us dry needle. But then the issue is not all of us dry needle. And so do we really offer dry needling or is it just a bonus that happens sometimes? So it's hard, but that's, I, I think in that case, it's like an intervention that we could offer versus a differential diagnostic um, evaluation that we need to be able to offer. Right, right. And this article is pretty strong on the value of the hints, you know, because it's great when we can rely on imaging, but that's not the case here. And so the idea is that this is a, a mission critical piece um, of, you know, doing what the ED is supposed to do, which is discern the life threatening from the, okay, this is benign and here's what we're going to do next to get you in, a, in the next right thing. I think the other thing to just clarify is that you don't have to be a vestibular specialist to practice in the emergency department. Uh, the way I think of it is you need to be able to, um, you need to be able to decide dangerous, not dangerous. Okay. Dangerous, get the people that do the dangerous things to do that. Not dangerous. Can I treat this today? Yes or no. So is this like a BPPB that I can actually do something about today? Or is this an acute neuritis that I'm going to provide patient education and an appropriate referral? That type of thing. So it's really very algorithm based. I, I don't need people to be able to initiate vestibular rehab. In fact, I would argue that we probably should not be initiating vestibular rehab in the emergency right. department. We should make sure that that person is connected to someone who will manage that for them. Um, so those are, those are the three things that I think are most critical. So if you can help with your um, staff to make sure, can they, can they differentiate dangerous, not dangerous? Can we treat this today? And if so, are we comfortable doing, you know, all of the BPPV maneuvers? And then um, do we know who to refer to? And can we decide right. if this patient is like actually safe to leave the department? 
Right. Now, Allison makes a good point. When there's a lot of turnover, even within PT staff, it could be hard. Um, but I think if you say, okay, because we all have onboarding, so you hire someone new, hence exam is part of the onboarding. And then, you know, the challenging part is probably the review and kind of how often that needs to be. But, you know, they do it with the, the hand washing videos, for goodness sake. So we can certainly uh, find a way. I think, um, you know, to to make that be a, a standardized um, part of our, our knowledge base, um, because the HINTS exam does not take long. And I would argue, um, you know, as you review it and as you get more practice, as you say, like, I don't think it takes 10 years to get good at a HINTS exam alone, you know, maybe to treat complex vestibular patients that have like concussion with a million problems. That's another ball of wax, but you guys are not having to worry about that. You know, you're not trying to treat someone over 12 weeks here. This is kind of a really a focal screening. Okay, so we've done our HINTS exam and we're like, ah, we feel pretty good about this. What's next? Right. So, you know, they go into some other elements. I was actually really intrigued and I wanted to ask your opinion on this, Rebecca. Uh, they talk about standing, um, which is another kind of uh, complementary way to try to screen. So standing omits a couple of things. It does not have test skew, for example, but it also includes um, having the patient walk. Um, do your physicians walk with your patients in the ED? No, um, very rarely. I, I would say the exam is never usually taking long enough for patients to even get disconnected from the machines to actually do that. So the other, the other thing I don't really particularly like about that is so many of my patients are in so much acute distress. There is no way they're standing up. There's no way they're sitting up. There's no way they're walking. Like they came by ambulance because they were crawling. They're not, they're not coming up. They're not walking just yet. So in that case, they might need symptom modulation um, before we try and emulate with them. They might need a bed level exam before we can do that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, most of my folks are not like ready to walk. They didn't walk in. They're not walking back out just yet. I had one right. guy fill six of the blue, uh, blue throw up bags. Like he needed fluids and a little Zofran, a little Ativan, like before we could even like take a run at that. So right. I, I, I think it's not a good test for deciding if somebody needs a stroke alert called. Will you find out bad things very fast? Yeah, but like you might also be clouded by the fact that the patient's function is super bad because they feel super bad and they're scared. That's also not, I, I feel like that is also not the time when they like have all their trust in you and, and are ready to like get up and try walking. For sure, for sure. So I wanted to point that out because I, I applauded them for, for trying to include mobility because I understand that like um, a patient who is less acute, we'll just say, like they're, they're definitely dizzy, they're definitely feeling bad, um, could maybe seem like they were peripheral. Um, I remember having a patient who um, the team, the neuro team was convinced they were ready to send home. He'd been in the hospital for like, I wanna say two days. Um, and the first MRI had been negative and he was in his fifties. And he had some spontaneous astigmas that to me did not, was not consistent with peripheral. He definitely didn't have BBBV. That was pretty clear, but he tolerated me checking him for it. Um, so that was pretty good. Um, and then, but when I was walking with him, he was so far leaned over. I'm like, this has got to be stroke. I don't care what that MRI said. <laughs> um, and so I refused to let him go home. Like I said, like, no, I'm not clearing him. The docs weren't happy. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, this is not peripheral. This is, this is because you know, a neuritis will be like, they don't feel good. And they'll be like, maybe want to kind of hold somebody, but they're not like, you know, the, the they're old, not usually the, falling down the V8 commercial situation. <laughs> like, um, yeah. And, uh, they ran a second MRI and it for sure was a, a cerebellar stroke and a big lesion actually that just had not evolved on the first one. So, yeah. And that's definitely something to be aware of. So with our, our summary recommendations, we we've made our diagnosis of acute vestibular syndrome. The article suggests that those patients, we do not use MRI or MRA as a first line diagnostic test and that we kind of move forward. 
Right. And get those patients right. on to the next step. So the best next step for these patients is what? Once you've ruled out acute stroke, uh, you are going to screen them. I mean, in, in the HINTS exam, you're going to pick up if you think they have a, a, an enteritis. That's that's part of the HINTS exam. So if they have a positive head impulse test, so they do have that corrective saccade, they have a spontaneous cystitis that's unilateral in nature, um, and they had a negative test of skew, hopefully. Uh, that's all putting you to neuritis. Um, you can still, if they will tolerate it, screen for BPPV. Um, there will be the occasional patient that could have both going on. Um, but if the HINTS exam says, I'm not seeing signs of stroke, no positive test of skew, no direction change in nystagmus, and I'm not seeing signs of a neuritis, we're thinking BBBV. And the article does a nice job of explaining how BBBV is very common, number one. Um, and number two, it doesn't have to be classic. <laughs> So just because the patient denies vertigo or denies feeling dizzy when they turn in bed or rolling over or sitting up or whatever, like that doesn't mean it's not BPPV. <laughs> so I was really grateful that the article touched on those things because as much as I love a good history, I think we all at this point in our career have had patients who, you know, we hear a history and we're kind of thinking one direction and we do our exam and we're like, oh, shoot, <laughs> like, you know. Um, and not just with vestibular uh, issues, I think that could be true of, of other issues as well, but certainly doing that proper screening, they talk about doing a Dix-Hall pike, and they even talk about the supine roll test and checking for horizontal canal. Which BPPV. was amazing to me. <laughs> Normally when I say that to a physician, they're like, what? Like that can happen? I'm like, yeah, there's like multiple canals in there. It's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting, but I did also find it to be interesting that they were like, you, you probably don't have the training to do this. So maybe <laughs> yeah. actually do it. They were like, you should do this. Just kidding. Like maybe you should actually hold off on doing this. One question that I have for you is that when yeah. I was in PT school, I was told like, Hey, like if the patient doesn't have the PPV, you don't want to do the Dick's hall pipe because you could give them the PPV. Wrong. Myth. Yes. Myth. I mean, I I never say never, but I've never had it happen to me. It's not in the literature. Like that is not a thing. And even people, people who are afraid of saying, oh, well, if I, you know, check for BPPV, it could convert to horizontal canal from posterior. Yeah, sure. It could, but it's still a benign condition. It's just going to need a different maneuver to clear it. So like, you know, like, I'm not saying I want to convert, but like, know that like, you know, even doing a maneuver that's for the wrong side, you're not going to pull more crystals out of place. It's very highly unlikely. I mean, I'm not saying never say never, but like you're just going to make them feel bad without correcting the problem because you're sw- you're shifting the crystals around, but you're not actually following the path to put them back. So, yeah. so we yeah. don't need to worry about that. We can just no. go for go no. the whole pike the world. Do your best. I mean, I there are there are clear situations where like. For example, the patient is like vomiting profusely for an hour. You're not going to get a dick hall pike in. <laughs> like that needs to be managed. I don't know. You just have to like hold the bag strategically. Oh my God. I, I like to have medical <laughs> students do that because they're still all like nice and helpful. You can try. I like to get for that group. And luckily it's not everybody with BBV is going to be that far down the lane. Like yeah. that kind of presentation is much more common with like your acute neuritis or something. You know, but for that group that they tend to have a motion sensitivity history, by the way, just so you know, and probably in some group of that, a migraine history, these sensitive folks, they're the ones who are going to really suffer with BPPV. Um, so here's so, the next question. This yeah, is also ahead. based on this article was a little bit of a myth too, right? Like, so patients, how concerned do we need to be about VBI? How concerned do we need to be about vertebral artery testing? Oh Should, my goodness. With the whole pipe. Yeah. Because I, I, I will freely admit I've had some patients and I've looked at their neck and I've looked at their cardiovascular history and I've looked at their blood pressure and I'm like, "Mm." like, I feel like I have a really high risk tolerance, but there have been moments where I've been like, uh, is this, is this actually dangerous? So what does the article say Here's the good news. The, here's the good news. Uh, the article has said this. I have experienced the same thing, which is 
if you put somebody, let's say you feel like it's sounding like BPPV and you feel like you could try doing vestibular risk screening, but it's very insensitive. So it's not necessarily going to help you that much to, to do the screening where you can rotate and kind of turn them back and sitting and, and see if you provoke it. If you did that screening and you got like neuroscience, you could stop there. It's all good. <laughs> you could say, I'm seeing signs of BVI. Really, really should do uh, a CT angio or preferably, uh, I believe it's an MRI would be preferred in the literature. Um, and just doing um, Dopplers is not sufficient. I know people sometimes think carotid Dopplers is sufficient. It is not um, to, to rule out VBI. So that's one thing. Um, but the second thing is if I think, oh, I'm going to try this Dix Hall Pike, and I have them in a Dix Hall Pike, and like you see any neuro signs, <laughs> you just stop. You, you know, you haven't taken them to true stroke level, probably. You just sit, you know, get them out of the position. You're done. You report. That's it. Right? But you have a minute to Hall pike. You see a classic, like right torsional upbeat, lasts about 10 seconds and goes away. And you're like, how you feeling? And they're like, I felt terrible. And now it's getting a little better. Okay. Like, boom, BPPV. Yeah. And the article was also very clear like, the risk of that is extraordinarily low. And it was like a negligible concern that we shouldn't even worry about it. Correct? Yeah, it's not zero. So I don't want people to think that it's if they see, zero. if they have someone in Dick's Hall Pike and then someone's starting to slur their speech that you just keep waiting and saying, I think I'm going to treat this BBPV. But like, <laughs> yeah, it's so rare. It's so rare. It's not zero. So yes, watch for those signs. But the actually the better way to screen instead of doing any kind of physical test um, is multiple risk factors, um, cardiovascular risk factors, and a reported history of, I was painting, I was like this, I got dizzy. I, and, and then again, there's usually some other neuro sign. Yes. It's usually not just dizziness. We're I felt our, a little weakness in my arm. I felt, you know, something neuro-ish. We're looking for our five Ds there, yeah? Um, yes. The other thing that I put in the chat are the IFOMT guidelines, which are the most up-to-date recommendations about screening the cervical region for potential vascular pathologies of the neck prior to any orthopedic manual therapy. I know that is an orthopedic thing and we're talking about neuro stuff, but they go hand in hand. Um, so I really think that more people need to be aware of these guidelines because like putting people in this position, like the research on that is absolutely horrible. And if that's what people are hanging their hat on before they're manipulating right. the cervical spine or they're doing something like this, then, then that's kind of uh, negligent at this point. So I would definitely recommend if you haven't re reviewing the iPhone framework and it's very helpful. Um, it talks a lot about different pathologies, different symptoms or presentations they might have based on where they're having issues, different headache presentations that you need to be aware of. Um, so those are all included in there as well. Um, very, very helpful, huge, again, massive document, but it has a lot of really great infographics in it. If you haven't, if you are practicing in the emergency department and you haven't yet put together like a quick reference binder, I would highly recommend that you do that and that you put the infographic from these GRACE guidelines as well as the IFOMT um, graphics in there. Uh, Acute Care Academy of APTA just updated lab values. I would print that out and put that in there as well. So when you're like, oh, I don't know, you can flip through that real quick and just take a look. It's okay to Google, but sometimes I'm a paper girl. And if you know what page it's on, you can flag it in the book and flip to it really quickly. I think sometimes right. that can be really helpful. Okay. Right. So 100%. we're treating our BPPV. We're making magic happen. Patients are happy. Providers are happy. And those patients are walking out and going where? Oh, my goodness. So, yes. Basically, if they have BPPV, if they have neuritis, if they have stroke, they're probably going to rehab. But, like, the first two for sure, please have a nice, uh, good list of trusted outpatient vestibular PTs at your disposal. and. If you're concerned about Meniere's disease, which they did touch upon briefly in the article, if that's not your forte, don't worry about it. The vestibular PT, if they suspect it, they'll probably point them to an ENT for further testing. Um, but, um, and, and same thing with vestibular migraine. If you suspect a vestibular migraine, they did do a nice job of, because it's so common, they're starting to suspect it is more common 
a, a more common cause of spontaneous recurrent episodic vertigo than BBBV, which is kind of crazy time because we always think of BBV as like the king. Uh, but they're starting to think that vestibular migraine might be a little little bit higher percent. Um, so and just to, just to throw a plug in there, this week's <laughs> podcast is about migraine in the emergency yes. department. If you haven't listened to that, I learned so much about migraine period, as well as migraine in the emergency department. And I have migraine, like it's a thing that I experience, and I learned a tremendous amount of information. So there will also be a blog post about that this week that will help you like with the vestibular migraine um, as well. So keep an eye out for that, but. For sure. For did sure. you see, can you take a look at this question in the chat and see what your thoughts are? Yes, are? yes. So if you see a downbeating, the stagmus on a Dix Hall Pike or a deep Dix Hall Pike would just kind of that um, deep head hang. It's, it's where the head's more neutral and you bring them all the way back. Usually in those cases, you're suspecting the very rare, but it does exist possibility of anterior canal BPPV um, or some uh, research is pointing to the idea that the otoconia, the little tiny crystals could be in the short arm, kind of this one little tiny section up at the top um, formal section um, kind of towards the, the the drop where they would go into the utricle. But anyway, this is kind of this little tiny section of the posterior canal, the short arm of the posterior canal. So whether the otoconia are in the anterior canal or the short arm of the posterior canal, you can get a downbeating nystagmus in the dicks or in the deep head hang or the deep dicks. Um, the problem is both of those actually are pretty rare. Um, and most downbeating nystagmus is from some central vestibular issue. So the question is, should we refer to neuro right away when we see that? So to me, 99% of the time, yes. The only time I wouldn't refer is if I put him in a Dick's Hall Pike uh, or a deep head hang and I see a downbeat and it lasts five, 10, 15 seconds. They're like, oh, I feel something. I'm like, oh, how are you doing now? Oh, it's gone. And that nystagmus is gone. That's acting like BBBV. And so I would probably actually sit them up, let them settle, do it again. Most of the time, I guarantee you, you're going to get a classic torsional upbeat because it was just in the short arm of the posterior canal. And now it's turned, in, turned into regular, um, your classic um, posterior canal BPPV presentation. And then you know how to treat that. Um, but if it's a persistent downbeat, the, pretty sure that basically there's no such thing as anterior canal cupulothiasis where it would stick to the cupula and create a sustained downbeat. So if I say sustained downbeat, refer. I, I'm going to go with the classic physical therapy answer. It depends. Um, it depends on the whole patient. Like what are, what was their history? Like, what are they looking like? What, um, kind of risk tolerance we have with this particular patient. I know that if I, it's super subtle and I call neuro, they're going to be like, like, what, why are you calling me? So in a lot of cases, just like you said, if it's looking like BPPV, I'm going to try and treat it too. And if it's not improving or if it's like making them feel worse, I'm going to just stop. But I think in those cases, I'm going to take a look at the whole particular patient before I make a decision about when to call neuro. And my experience with calling neuro is half the time they agree with me, half the time they disagree with me. And so you just never know how it's going to go. A lot of times I'll think a patient is having something really serious and they'll be like, it's just BPPV. I'm like, can confirm it is not. So if you're not worried about it being something scarier, that's fine. But we're going to disagree on what the actual diagnosis is. Yeah. Well, the challenge and think about downbeat nystagmus. So I call it a brain issue, but it could be everything from an acute stroke to a congenital downbeat, which nobody's going to do anything about, to a transient downbeat because vestibular migraine often presents with a vertical nystagmus, more often downbeat than upbeat, but it can be upbeat. Usually it's slow, um, a much slower, less brisk, kind of a mild, quiet one. Um, it can be Chiari malformation kind of talking a little bit. It can be a degenerative cerebellar disease that won't show on MRI at first because it's early. I mean, we're talking gamut here. <laughs> so the bad news is you could kind of say, hey, I'm seeing a downbeat and it's persistent and I know it's not BBV, it's not acting like it. Hopefully they won't say it's BBV. Hopefully they'll say, huh, it could be one of these many things. The MRI is negative. <laughs> We're going to have to monitor for other neuro signs over time. That would be the most responsible approach. 
And then you're looking for kind of what's happening over time. So if someone's starting to present with, you know, repeat little episodes and they're having other signs that fit the migraine criteria, we're headed down that road. If they start to present with like an intention tremor and other stuff, oh, looks like that it might be, oh, now we can see that it's degenerative cerebellar. There does show, you know, and it was just, that was an early sign. And that's, you know, one of the, probably the more challenging things about vestibular conditions as well is that some of them are either come and go or they evolve. So, you know, kind of what you're seeing has to be repeat over time, um, which is more going to happen in your outpatient, although there could be somebody who comes in now the ED, depending. And I've seen that happen as well. So just keep that in mind, I guess I would say. All right. Are you ready for another question? What? Do we think about medication in the emergency department for dizziness mm. after reading this paper? Uh -huh. Well, wow. uh, they, were, <laughs> they, they were even light on the, the antiemetics. I am all about the antiemetics because- I am too. I hate vomit. <laughs> I have to tell you, I never thought I would work in a hospital and here I am like 10 plus years later. Vomit is not my favorite. It's not my least favorite bodily fluid, but it right. is not my favorite. <laughs> and it always happens right around lunchtime. Yeah, it's right. really good for fasting. But um, yeah, like I, I also don't, patients don't want to like suffer. So I, I'm kind of like pro antiemetic. Here's the thing. Antiemetics, to my knowledge, are not addictive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not something that somebody's going to want to keep taking just for the heck of it, probably, yeah. you know, so it's going to be as needed. Um, and they're really, to me, to get somebody over a hump. Is yes. that hump an acute BPPV? That's just the fact that they kind of are motion sensitive and so it's just too much, you know, and in order to really properly assess and properly get a good clearance, I'm going to need that a little more managed, you know, because I'm midway through a maneuver and all of a sudden they need to go to the can, you know, throw up in, in a... I, I, now that's lost. I can't, I got to have to start over essentially. Right. And like, I just don't like that burnout if I can help it. Like I want to get a nice clean maneuver and hopefully clear them in one or two rounds. And then, you know, they're going to feel like washed out and weird for a while, but at least we've gotten the main issue done. Right. What about meclizine? Everybody's favorite. <laughs> God bless Meclizine. Man, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Whoever was the marketer for Meclizine is a god and I want to hire them. They because... need to get a gold star. They for sure do. <laughs> uh, they really got some set of doctors and instructors at universities for physicians to get that message across that that was the way to treat uh, any sense of dizziness that seems to be vestibular in nature, we'll just say. <laughs> I so... even see it for some orthostatic <laughs> hypotension. I'm like, what are we doing, folks? So we actually, in our emergency department, have an algorithm for dizziness. And the algorithm states that if a peripheral cause of vertigo is suspected, you do not give meclizine until the physical therapist evaluates the patient. Now, there are some physicians that feel like that's unethical because they think that they should be giving patients symptomatic relief. I would argue that based on this article, hopefully that's not going to continue to be the standard of practice because the article is really suggesting that it doesn't make a difference particularly with BPPV, because BPPV is mechanical. So meclizine is not really going to make any kind of difference. But what about other medications? Like what if, if we do need to advocate for a patient to receive a medication, how should we be advocating? Yeah, the best, the best argument is probably for two cases. One is uh, an acute neuritis where your hope is that some sort of, you know, um, vestibular suppressant, meclizine is only one of several options, um, is, is kind of a, a way to again, get someone over the hump a little bit on the dizziness side. So taking away nausea, that's just dizziness, then it might tamp it down or just allow them to sleep, frankly, um, so that they can have that kind of, just like when you first twisted your ankle, you're not jumping right to exercises, right? You gotta kind of, you know, just let it settle down a little bit for a day. <laughs> you know, maybe put it up, whatever feels good. I sure, whatever, just kind of let it settle before you start that gentle movement, right? That's fair. So the same thing, you know, for that person after their acute neuritis, give them a day or two, you know, just kind of let them like settle out. And if meclizine helps them bridge that fine, but then that's it, it goes away. Uh, we don't take it anymore. And then we can do proper, hopefully vestibular rehab to get adaptation so that we get our best outcomes. 
Um, Because ongoing magazine over months and years is detrimental to any kind of like ability for the brain to make changes in a positive way to manage movement better after these conditions. And that other condition besides neuritis would be any kind of acute, so like central issue. So a stroke being a good example, you know, somebody's really dizzy from that. I mean, nausea, maybe dizziness. Again, if it's nausea, I go anemetic, but if it's true dizziness and they just need something to kind of tamp it down so they can sleep, rest, whatever, like enough to kind of settle out in that acute phase of a day or two, maybe with stroke three, I don't know, maximum. And then we're coming off so that we can start to let the brain do its work. Perfect. So we're running out of time. Ah. So tell me, what do you want people to take home from this? I, I think the infographic that comes with this article is excellent. Golden. It's, I think that that is a thing that you could print out and keep with you. I also think um, for me, making sure you're understanding the difference between the AVS, the SEVS, the TEVS um, classification. The titrate article is very good if you haven't read that to help understand that and work on that differential diagnosis. Also very helpful. So what do you want people to take home from this article? Yeah, I think the the big thing here is, you know, as physical therapists, um, it's such an opportunity uh, to check in with your team in the ED, see where they're at. Are they, have they heard of the guidelines? Is this something they're already doing? That's awesome. Like, oh, this is new. Great. Like, do you want us, you know, how could we help support? You know, y'all know how to frame things positively. <laughs> so just kind of, you're not saying here, I'm going to tell you what to do. And here's what, you know, the guidelines say, no, it's like, oh, like, you know, how can we be, you know, the best team, um, in the ED, you know, and, and see what they want to do. If they're like, no, I want to read it on my own. Okay, sure. If you think they will, you know, they're doctors, they, you know, can read, um, you know, like I, I like to, you know, just have a good relationship, which I hope you all do. Um, because then that, and if they're like, you know what I, I will offer, I'm like, would you like me to put something together? You know, would you like, you know, what, what of this is unfamiliar on these guidelines even like, you know, or, or would you want me to, you know, do an in-service on, or, you know, let's do record something so it can be watched on demand. I think that's really great for learners at this point. It's just that in-person training is just real hard to coordinate. Yeah. Um, and as much as I love the hands-on, but, you know, just at least a mix, maybe something, you know, <laughs> to provide opportunity and that by itself, you know, in that positive way, I think that's the biggest way that we can help. And I've done this with outpatient, you know, in it, you know, I've told the primary care, look, you don't have to be an expert, but just know this, you know, and, and then you could be the one to say, Hey, I think this person should go to the ED. Hey, I'm pretty sure I saw something on the Dick's Hall Pike, go next door and see Helena. Like, you know, you kind of try to build these relationships wherever you're at. Um, I don't know. To me, that's the biggest takeaway because really the, like you said, the infographic is number one and it goes through like, you know, kind of the pieces that we should be educated on most strongly, whether, whatever, whenever we're dealing with acute vertigo, whoever we are, what discipline. I think it's also really helpful that this is an emergency medicine journal that posts, that published this as well, because I, we had a journal club on this at work last week. And one of my PTs was really trying to advocate for a patient to, to actually get advanced imaging in this particular case. And the physician was really pushing back and he pulled the whole 45 page thing out of his pocket. And he was like, well, if you look at these guidelines and the physician was like, well, you obviously know more about this than I do. So let's go ahead and do that. And it actually ended up um, making a tremendous difference. So I'm not saying you should walk around with the article in your pocket, but really knowing where the, where the information came from being evidence-based and being able to share that both with your patients and with your provider team, I think is essential. Right. Agreed. And I think you know, I've had a lot of folks say to me, oh, I went to the ED, you know, to check if it was, they, they, they checked if it was a stroke, it wasn't a stroke. So it must be VBB. And so I think just, you know, us kind of keeping in mind these other possible diagnoses, they talk about TIA, which I feel like also comes up as, as really common. And actually the article again says that that's not really a super common cause of isolated dizziness. Correct. So if you're talking about multiple neuro signs, okay, that could have been a TIA for sure. Right. But if we're talking about pure dizziness alone, you're probably looking at one of these other issues, whether it's vestibular migraine. And 
Now, one of those tricky things about vestibular migraine is, and again, watch that episode on migraine. Um, Rebecca, I'm sure, is, is familiar with this. Um, you know, the dizziness can be seconds. It doesn't have to be hours. This article kind of talks about migraine lasting. And it, it is true over repeat episodes overall, but you have to look at like all the episodes. Like, and when people are kind of maybe just starting to have vestibular migraine, it can be very murky, right? Because they haven't had yes. 20 episodes with kind of a sense of, oh yeah, I have light sensitivity with it. Oh yeah, I've had some headaches on and off. Like if it's their first, second or third episode and, of vestibular migraine, we don't know yet. And they might also never have a headache. Like a headache Correct. is just one, one symptom of migraine. So I think that's an excellent point. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, we do have a journal club every quarter. So keep your eye out for that. If you want to sign up for the newsletter on the website to make sure you don't miss any, that's great. Also, if you are feeling like after this, you're like, hey, like I need some more vestibular teaching and learning, we are going to have a two-part webinar series coming for you by the end of the summer, one about diagnosis of, of dizziness in the emergency department, and then the second one will be about intervention in the emergency department. And then the next piece, just to add to that, is we will follow that in January with an in-person hands-on course in the Denver area. That will be on... January 13th, which is the Saturday of Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, because I'm hoping maybe you're like, hey, I want to go to Denver and go skiing on that four-day weekend. <laughs> so just to have that on your radar. Um, so those things are upcoming. If you are feeling like you are having trouble with your emergency department practice in general, or you are trying to start a program, we have an upcoming two-day course in Boston in September. I am going to add a extra two-hour webinar, or not webinar, two-hour session to that a couple of days prior about digital triage to actually keep patients out of the emergency department. So if you're in the Boston area, we are coming very soon. And otherwise, I just got the the blog about migraine is up and posted. I linked that for you in the chat and please go ahead and listen to the podcast. You will find a, another podcast episode with Dr. Esmond uh, in the next couple of weeks. I think PT Pinecast is actually going to release that for us. So you'll find that on his streaming platforms. And I guess just to finally wrap up, but does anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to share before we finish up? And thanks for the ones uh, that you all put in along the way, by the way, I have been noticing, even if they were just kind of like a, a comment, like, thank you for saying not to just do Doppler ultrasounds. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Sydney says that was very helpful. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Ah, oh, so much to learn. Any recommendations for cheap goggles to block fixation? Ooh. I don't use them. Um, we have not been able to get them approved in a capital budget yet. So I'm not, I'm not the person to ask, but Dr. Esmond can uh, discuss yeah. that with you for sure. Yeah. So you have a few options. So Vestibular First has a pair, I don't know if I call them cheap. They're you know, more in the affordable range than some at 2,500. Some people that's not their budget either. And I understand that. So there are folks who will use like basically the thick and lens frenzels of some sort. Those are like 500 to $700. Um, they're better than nothing. They do lose about two thirds of the abnormal eye movements in someone with vestibular pathology. Um, and there are like some other ones. I know there's one that just came out of Japan that's like called an F loop. Um, I don't know if it's easily attainable, but it's just, again, it's a thickened lens um, that's kind of a fractionated to try to kind of remove visual fixation. So there are different versions out there. What we can do afterwards is I'll, I'll get a couple of links to Rebecca um to post up for you guys on her website or something and uh, we'll try to help you with those options i did just link uh, a blog post from dr esmond on our website and there are some links there of places you can look for different goggles um, and different references there as well so you can find all her contact information on that and that was from may so that is linked there for you as well um my kristen my experience with steroids treating neuritis I, I don't really see uh the benefit because they get that in the emergency department and then i don't see them again so i'm, I'm going to defer on that question as well yeah well the literature is mixed on it to be quite honest and including I think in this article including yes. this one yes and yep. the issue is because the people who are getting steroids i don't think it's always clear is it Meniere's that we don't know it's Meniere's yet? Is it a true single episode of neuritis? 
Um, you know, what's the root cause of the neuritis? Because if it's like a clot, a little tiny clot to the inner ear, this will not help. Whereas mm -hmm. if it was like a true inflammatory infection, it could help. So um, I, 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 this is just me from reading multiple articles. This seems to be why it's kind of to date, we haven't really been able to get a pure, like this is the one cause of the neuritis is definitely an infection. And we definitely, you know, calmed it down with the steroids because that's the concept, right? Is you're kind of calming down an active inflammation. So, you know, if it's an acoustic neuroma that we don't know that's what it is yet, and it's kind of growing and then slowing down, steroids might not slow that, you know, might not affect that. So this is why it's a mixed bag. It's generally not going to cause bad side effects, which is why they'll try it. <laughs> um, so just know that if it gets tried and your patient's like, hey, this didn't really help. I would just reassure them that like, look, it just kind of depends on maybe kind of root cause of, of why your inner ear was, you know, kind of having a problem. Um, and just know that, that the body still can heal itself to an extent on its own in the inner ear and that whatever doesn't heal, the brain will adapt. So it's all good. We got plans. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate having you here. We hope you'll be here next quarter for our next journal club. If you have anything you'd really like to have discussed, please reach out and let me know. And this will be available for replay on our YouTube channel, just in case you wanna go back and review any of it. Thank you guys so much and have a great night. Thanks everybody.